Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, meeting and I think we'll we'll make a start as the last few people join us. Um, um, my name's uh, Rachel Garnham, I'm a member of Labour's National Executive Committee and it's um, it's really good to be chairing this after spending the last few days arguing about Labour's internal bureaucracy and moving on to a somewhat bigger issue. Um, so this, is, this event is, um, we're going to be talking about Trump's war on China and it's part of Arise, an online festival of Labour's left ideas. And um, it's, it's great that you could join us. Um, as we all know, we're going through a major crisis and we need to put forward ways to transform our world and put people, health and planet first. And part of this has to be changing the way the world is ordered and standing up to those leaders globally who promote the policies of war and hate. And this means most notably, of course, President Trump and his xenophobia towards Chinese communities across the world and his building up of a military presence in Asia. And we're looking forward to hearing up from our speakers tonight about how we can do that. So Arise is a celebration of our values of peace, internationalism, solidarity and unity. And it's really good to have this discussion as part of it with the participation of the Stop the War Coalition and other peace campaigners and very excellent heroes of mine on the Labour left. Um, and due to the amazing level of interest, as well as this Zoom webinar, we're streaming live direct from the Arise YouTube page and across various Facebook pages. And as the event goes on, please do post questions in the comments below the stream on there and in the Q&A section on Zoom. And we, we should have plenty of time to put them to our panel. So our speakers tonight are going to be Murad Qureshi from Stop the War Coalition, Emma Dent Code, councillor, former MP and longtime campaigner for peace and social justice. Jenny Clegg from the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament International Advisory Group and the author of China's Global Strategy. And to finish up, hero of the left, Diane Abbott, MP. Um, and they will each speak in that order and then we'll have questions. So I'm going to hand over to Murad to kick us off. Thanks, Murad. Thank you, uh, Rachel and Arise for giving me this opportunity to speak this evening on uh, a geopolitical issue which I that is anti-racism, anti-war and anti-nuclear. So for example, the anti-racism, we've just got to be aware about uh, what the impact of the whole lockdown has had on Chinese uh, people. Uh, I noticed in Chinatown when I went for the new year, how the businesses were down by 50%. And, um, the, um, and the surveys were showing that uh, people were trying to avoid uh, those of Oriental descent. And that was before the lockdown. Since then, uh, we've had the regressive comments that um, President Trump's made utterances, which have added only to the problems uh, on that front. Now, ultimately, uh, we'll need global cooperation uh, to defeat um, the coronavirus, um, both medically and economically. And that's been well said by uh, the German president recently, um, Frank Walter Stanmerer, who said it's not actually a war, as many um, world leaders would suggest. It's actually a test of humanity. And on that basis, I think we've got to say uh, no to xenophobia and yes to global cooperation uh, when we're challenging the racism. As for the anti-war aspect, I mean, uh, the greatest threat to the US is not actually a foreign adversary, uh, it's actually the, the virus. Um, they've lost over 100,000 people now, so far, and who knows how many more they may lose to the virus with a second wave. And what they need most is vaccines, uh, PPE and uh, the uh, track, trace and isolate methods uh, in, in the States. But there's no sign of that. And um, would, you, would you believe, amazingly, during the lockdown, uh, President uh, Trump has actually extended militarization, but this time into space. He's set up the, the Space Force um, um, during this, and which undoubtedly will in involve uh, uh, additional monies to be spent on that 
extension of American forces. That's why we at Stop the War, as well as the UN, uh, are calling for a global ceasefire and all military conflicts in places like Yemen particularly. Um, and I'm glad to see there are people at the, in, and on the other side of the um, uh, other side of the pond, like Bernie Saunders, actually suggesting that they need to see a 10% reduction in their military expenditure and prioritise the, the expenditure there on the efforts against the virus. So I think what the US needs is a, a virus cure, not a war, uh, clearly from, uh, from what we see. As for the anti-nuclear front, I think people have lost sight of some of the things Trump is up to on this front um, because he is threatening the nuclear peace. Um, his um, his uh, America First policies uh, are clearly leaving no space for multilateralism and um, strengthening things like the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is in its 50 year, 50th year, seems doomed now. There was hope to, to strengthen it, but that uh, has gone to the by side with Trump's positions on, uh, on, um, on America First. And it's similar with, um, with uh, agreements with uh, Russia, the anti-ballistic missiles treaty, the strategic arms um, limitations have all fallen away. And if anything, what's happened between Russia and America is that they're both now actually modernizing their nuclear arsenal, which is the last thing we want. And given that we had, um, um, we, had uh, we had previous leaders of, 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 the, uh, of the US and, and Soviet Union sit, sitting down and signing these agreements, it's, it's, it's a bad omen. And on top of that, let's not forget, he pulled out of the, the Iranian nuclear deal and is almost uh, set to walk out on the nuclear testing ban as well. So that's, that's, that's where we are. And I think our response from the left is to, to keep up our anti-racist, anti-war and anti-nuclear convictions in our pro progressive internationalism uh, and long may that continue. Uh, I think there are certainly some battles to be fought um, to up to November and beyond actually, because he'll still be there uh, till January if he loses the election in November. Brilliant, thank you Morad. And our next speaker is Emma Denkcode, over to you, Emma. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thanks to Arise for, um, for asking me to speak on this, which is a huge, huge worry. Um, um, obviously, I've been reading a lot about this, and um, Trump is a massive threat to, to world peace. Um, partly, it's, it's his ego gets in the way of every, everything. Um, he's a man with a, with a big, big mouth and very little hands, and I mean that metaphorically as well as um, physically. Um, uh, and we seem to be playing a game of who's got the biggest army. So, you know, I, I had a little rummage around today um, looking at who's got the biggest army between the United States, China and Russia. Um, actually, it looks like Russia has, if you count their reserves, um, they've got a million active um, military and uh, two million reserves. China has 2.7 million. They're probably all in active service. Uh, Russia has 1.3, but that includes everything, including their reserves. Um, um, but bizarrely, um, the US spends double the amount of China, who has double uh, the amount of um, active military. Um, so there's um, there's a kind of there's a mystery there where the money goes. Um, you're looking at their nuclear weapons, as Mara was talking about, um, there this seems to be they're trying to sort of divvy up to, to this so we get getting some sort of arms race um, between the, the uh, major nations and, and what they've got, what, you know, what their warheads are and what they've got stashed away and, um, you know, 90% of the world's nuclear weapons are between the US and Russia and, and, and here we are, we've got two people whose interests are miles away um, uh, from each other, um, Putin um, and Trump, who are working very closely together for some utterly, utterly bizarre, mysterious reason. Um, some of which we may understand and guess, and some of which we don't. So there's a kind of they're building up their their nuclear armory, and um, this um, you know the idea that he that Trump could be could be be friends with um, Putin um, and kind of boosting their, their anti-China um, position while uh, military and uh, the intelligence unit either they were or weren't putting bounties on US um, and allied troops in, in Afghanistan. You know, is this true? Because this was actually 
um, and it, intelligence which came to our own um, security service here. So it sounds like maybe that was true. So I'll be entering a new arms race um, and, and a cold war between between these these major powers. Um, I find that all very alarming. Um, so on the one hand, Trump will praise um, Xi Jinping for um, how he treats the Uyghurs and saying, oh, that's a really good idea. You know, they're all Muslims. We've got to, we've got to lock them up. They're, they're terrorists, it's absolutely disgraceful. Um, and then um, and then we'll on the other side, keep on talking about the, the China virus and stoking awful racism, absolutely unforgivable racism against um, uh, many people I'm sure who in America have, have been born and bred there. Um, and meanwhile, you know, China's huge threat really is um, their economy and their tech because no other nation has that um, and they could overtake the, the, um, the American economy very quickly, especially if Trump keeps um, letting, letting people die from coronavirus with, um, with total disdain, it seems very frightening. Um, aside from that, you know, we're um, United States supported by the UK. Uh, with with you know selling weapons, um, turning a blind eye to uh, Trump's racism, uh, pretending we're not racism when oh my god, uh, some of the things that have come out of the mouth of our prime minister I find very alarming indeed. Um, so you know it is um, what's happening in Hong Kong is it a threat to democracy or is it a threat to our immigration policy? Imagine if. Um, all the people who we say are, would be entitled to come over and spend their five years here, um, have a right to work and study and so on, if even if, you know, 10% of them came, how would we deal with that? Especially when um, racism against Chinese has been stoked as well over here, which um, I find really unspeakable. And I know because I've got a lot of uh, contacts in universities. I know in um, Liverpool University, uh, white British students were asked to walk around with Chinese students because they were being abused daily and even physically attacked daily. This is happening on our streets already while they're saying, oh no, we'll have the Hong Kong Chinese because it's such a terrible mess. It's clearly um, anti, anti-Chinese anti rather than pro-Hong Kong. I don't know. It's this, this, this stuff going on there, which is uh, beyond my comprehension and I think beyond many of our comprehension. So you know, are we going to allow this um, this anti-Chinese racism to fester um, in the United States and over here while we open the do doors to um, to Hong Kong Chinese um, who are clearly having a hideous battle? This is all about this, this power play. It's the um, willy waving of all these uh, massive powers, which is terrifying. And they're putting our money into it, while, which, while as Murat has said, we are wasting money on a cold war. We can never press the button. We commit genocide if we press any of those buttons. How can we waste all this money on this cold war um, when we should be fighting coronavirus uh, and feeding our hungry neighbours in our country and elsewhere and we are struggling in North Kensington by the way but um, um, clearly um, America is in a terrible state financially and economically um, and racism is is just festering and I find it very very um, depressing uh, we on the left must stand together as Mara just said and um, um, and keep on fighting the fight for anti-racism um, and anti-war anti-nuclear um, and I will whatever platform I have and thank you for tonight um, I will always speak out on that um, on that front so thank you brilliant thank you Emma reminding us why it was so devastating that you lost your seat in December and thank you for keep keeping on fighting the good fight um, as we we all try to do um, um, I just wanted to say a big welcome to everyone who's joined us. We've got over 250 people with us from Stoke, Aberdeen, Farnborough, Chippenham, London, Northampton, Skipton, Southport, Lancashire, Dudley, Birmingham and the Netherlands. So uh, welcome to all of you and do get your questions in. Our next speaker is Jenny Clegg, who is the CND International Advisory Group member and the author of China's Global Strategy. 
over to you, Jenny. Thank you. OK, hello to everybody here and um, thank you to Arise for inviting me to join this panel. Um, so just as we see how the COVID crisis has shown very starkly how we urgently need countries to cooperate, uh, the international situation has become more confrontational with US-China relations deteriorating rapidly. Um, uh, for those of us who've been involved in Stop the War and CND over the years, this comes as no surprise. We saw the first signs of this in 1997 with the neocons uh, setting up their project for a new America century, uh, which was designed uh, to prevent the rise of any regional competitor. Um, and we had in 2011, um, Obama adopting the Asian pivot. Um, now with Trump, for someone who's so remarkably inconsistent, he's been remarkably consistent in turning the US against China. First of all, Russia and China were identified as great power rivals. Then, since the threat was of such a huge magnitude, the military budget have to be massively increased to pay for new mini nukes and space weapons. The trade war began in 2018. Then we had the technology war in the form of the ban on the Chinese company Huawei. The Indo-Pacific is now seen as the main area of global contest and the US is trying to bring Japan, India and Australia into a joint military partnership. Um, all of this while the US has withdrawn from international agreements and treaties so as not to constrain the assertion of US power in any way. What is new now with the COVID crisis is that uh, the way that Trump has used the racialized rhetoric to cast China as the villain, elevating differences into the realm of ideology. You know, when this is about trade or technology, then countries can negotiate. But if China is called a liar, if China is racially abused, um, what is there to talk about? Once the China threat is seen in existential terms as a threat to the civilizational values of the world, this gets into the territory of a new Cold War. So why is this happening? Well, yeah, of course, Trump is using xenophobia to mobilize his base, but it's not just about the election. Uh, even with Biden, he may use different tactics, but he won't alter the strategic direction. The US has no intention of relinquishing its position of world dominance and accepting the multipolar trend, which is growing as the global economy shifts towards the East and towards the developing South. When the Chinese just made t-shirts, there was no problem. But now China, Chinese manufacturing is moving up the value chain, starting to compete with core industries in the West. And so Trump wants to stop China's economic development. Um, I'd argue, however, that we shouldn't see China as a rival. It's a competitor, which is a very different thing. And even if China does overtake the US in economic size, maybe in 10 to 15 years, and even if it competes at the cutting edge of some key technologies, uh, it will not become the dominant economic superpower. It's still a developing country and will be so for a long time. It has a lot of catching up to do. I think similarly to talk about Chinese aggression is to render the word meaningless. China is making rapid advances in military technology, but its weapons are essentially for defense. For example, with uh, nuclear weapons, it has what? 280 nuclear warheads, the US has 6,000. Uh, the Chinese have a policy of no first use. Um, you know, China doesn't go around starting wars, dropping bombs on people. And uh, for all the skirmishes that there are in the South China Sea, no single shot has ever been fired. The US has 500 military bases, many surrounding China, and China has just one. That's even less than India. So I hardly see China rivaling the US as global hegemon or military policeman. What China does do, and maybe this is the problem also for the United States, is to follow an independent foreign policy. It hasn't supported the wars in the Middle East and nor does it support sanctions, for example, against Iran. So now Trump is, having turned the US against China now wants to divide the world using the issue of Huawei to force countries to choose sides and to decouple from China. Uh, decoupling would result, uh, would be very, very costly for the world economy. We're seeing the pressure now in NATO, 
uh, which now claims that China is competing with our way of life and multiplying threats to our individual freedoms. Uh, we also feel the pressure here in Britain with a new group of hardline Tory rightists uh, who set up a China research group who are seeking to disengage from China completely. Funnily enough, their biggest obstacle is Johnson, who's tried to put up some resistance uh, to US pressure to ban, uh, ban Huawei. And Tony Blair has just come forward to uh, argue in favor of the pro-US position on the matter. It seems to me the Labour Party seriously needs to have a discussion about Britain's place in the world, facing up to our declining influence and the real shifts in world economic power. I think our jobs for the future depends on that. But I don't see much sign that the current Labour leadership understands what's at stake here, and I can easily see them drifting into a new Cold War and the trend towards greater militarisation and nuclearization. So Trump right now is deploying even more aircraft carriers and nuclear weaponry in, in the Pacific and is trying to put together a coalition of the willing, which would in effect be a global NATO. Uh, Trump is piling on the threats to China's sovereignty, passing new acts on Hong Kong and Xinjiang to add to those already covering uh, Tibet and Taiwan. And incidentally, I think that you'll find that any of the uh, uh, legislation that covers Hong Kong actually says that that China has direct authority over Hong Kong. Um, so so um, I'd also mention the media here because it's constantly casting China in negative terms uh, and people in the Western China are being driven apart by this. And the danger is that you know, Chinese people, young people are being alienated from the West um, and um, there will be a surge of, of anti-Western nationalism in China. Um, as to an actual war, this seems unlikely because the stakes are so high. Um, but then again, wars can start by accident. Uh, situations can escalate out of control when nations feel they have to defend their prestige. The danger here is that the US is being challenged by a non-Western power and it sees the situation in highly emotive yellow peril terms as a threat to Western civilization. There's no coherent US plan. Diplomacy hasn't yet failed, but it might. And we know that Trump is capable of crazy things. And if the election looks like it's going badly for him, he could do anything. And I think that China is readying uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, very interesting stuff and quite scary. Um, our final speaker, uh, champion of people and of peace around the world and um, the best shadow home secretary we've ever had in the Labour Party, Diane Abbott MP. Thank you very much, Rachel. Can you hear me? Because I always worry uh, with all this technology. First of all, I want to congratulate Arise on organising this very timely meeting because just today in Parliament, Boris Johnson announced a very generous citizenship offer to Hong Kong residents. Now, I'm all in favour of governments offering generous citizenship offers. I only wish you offer one as generous to EU citizens, but that's a meeting for another day. But what I would say is this offer, I think, is more about being anti-Chinese than pro the ordinary people of Hong Kong. So only someone who's willfully ignorant, never switches on the news or reads a newspaper, could honestly deny that there's no Cold War being waged by Trump against China. From trade wars to sanctions to propaganda to fleets of aircraft carriers, it's clear the United States is attempting to encircle China diplomatically. But I want to explain why I think this is bad for us, bad for the world, how remote this may seem to us living in Britain. In 1997, I visited China and Hong Kong twice. I visited them before handover, and I visited them after handover. And one of the things that struck me about the debate and what commentators were saying was people then, and I'm afraid now, talk about Hong Kong as if it's still some kind of British colony. I mean, we signed an agreement with the Chinese, and so we need to be really careful I mean, you can frame it in human rights, but we need to be really careful about talking about Hong Kong 
as if it is some sort of British colony and also conveniently forgetting that when Hong Kong was part of the British Empire, they didn't have rights. They didn't, they didn't have a vote. I mean, it's extraordinary that China is now being criticised for not allowing the Hong Kong Chinese rights that they never had under the British. Um, so there's many reasons to be concerned at Trump's all round defensive against China, both for small scale and material reasons, as well as large scale reasons, and the fact it could be potentially disastrous for the whole world. And one reason has been touched on by my colleagues at this event. We've seen a general rise in racism, and because of Trump's anti-Chinese offensive, we're seeing a very sad rise in anti-Chinese racism. I mean, it's linked to the coronavirus pandemic, um, but we've seen a, a rise in anti-Asian racism and xenophobia. Um, Human Rights Watch, among other organisations, has pointed this out. And I'm afraid it's politicians like Trump, when he talks about Wuhan flu and Hung flu and Chinese flu, it's politicians like Trump that are fueling the rise in anti-Chinese racism and xenophobia. And he's using the coronavirus crisis to achieve that. And he knows what he's doing. And he knows that in the US, Chinese students, fifth generation Japanese Americans, Korean shopkeepers will all literally be in the firing line when he talks about Wuhan flu and Chinese flu and the rest. Because frankly, racists don't distinguish between lang languages and particular ethnic groups when they go on the rampage. But what can you expect from a president who shares white power videos? Trump's policies stand together. He's the US president who's offered US citizens whatever their color next to nothing. And now through the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the way like Boris has mishandled it, he's let 125,000 American people die. And of course, he's going to try and find scapegoats in sanctions, in trade wars, in racism, and in white power. As you know, I'm a socialist. I'm certainly an apologist to the Chinese authorities. They can answer for themselves. But I've joined this meeting today, so I'm absolutely, I've made absolutely clear that I'm opposed to Trump's new Cold War in China because of the damage it's going to do to us all and even greater potential damage to if the Cold War gets any hotter. One of the members of Trump's administration is a man called Peter Navarro. And one of his many anti-China books is called The Coming China Wars. Let's hope that's just wishful thinking. But I couldn't leave this meeting, meeting currently without mentioning the Black Lives Matter movement. And I did say movement, not a moment. Um, Black Lives Matter is an incredible phenomenon. One of the most amazing things to me is how much clear majority support there is in the US and in this country. I don't think it's ever happened before. When the Black Lives Movement first emerged a few years ago, it didn't have the support from white Americans that Black Lives Matter has today. Um, and the reason I raise it, and I want to end on this, because I do think it's relevant to this, because you see, terrible things are done in the name of fighting enemies, real or imagined at home abroad. And as I said earlier, once you've dehumanized people, you can scapegoat them, you can even attack them. But when the people that you are deeming the enemy at home, that is to say people who are supporting Black Lives Matter, turn out to be the majority, and we are seeing majority support in America for the broad thrust of the Black Lives Matter movement, not a moment, uh, Black Lives Matter has created a problem for Trump. And I hope we can do in here in Britain the same for Boris Johnson. Because you know, tens of thousands of people have died from coronavirus. We're hearing today about thousands of jobs are going to be lost. And people don't want to hear how bad it is over there. People want jobs, they want their loved ones to die. They don't want people out of their homes. They want fair treatment. They demand the right to prospect, protest. They don't want cops kneeling on their necks. American and British people want these. I don't want to hear about imagined foreign enemies. They want action, they want answers on jobs, pay, 
the NHS and an end to the scandal in our care homes. China didn't cause any of those problems. The Tories did. And Black Lives Matter is speaking for our entire nation when it says no return to what was quote unquote normal. This must end. Thank you very much for inviting me to sit at this meeting. Brilliant. Thank you, Diane. I can't tell you how much we miss you on the Labour Party National Executive Committee. <laughs> uh, right, I've got some questions that have come in. I'm going to, essentially, it's a round of three questions and I'll ask the, the speakers to um, come in on what, you know, whichever one they, they want to come in on. Um, so the first question is, what do the speakers think of the use of sanctions as another means of war by Trump? against China, but also Iran, Venezuela, and many other countries. So the, that's the first one on sanctions. The second one, um, Diane's touched on this already, but um, Black Lives Matter is causing us to reflect on our imperial history. How do we educate people about the UK's historic role as a colonial power in China? And the third one is, is there a danger of the Labour Party becoming a more unfriendly place for the anti-war movement? Um, uh, who'd like to come in first? Murad, do you want to go first as you were the first speaker? Thank you, Rachel. And I'll touch on all three because I think that they're, 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 they're all important in their own right. Uh, yes, there's a clear pattern. Um, the sanctions, actually, it's... It's the most instinctive response Trump has had to everything that's happened. He's, there is not a place in the world he hasn't sanctioned, apart from us, I suspect. Um, but, and that's only a matter of time. Uh, and we've also got to realise very often sanctions are a prelude often to war. If you look at what happened, for example, the Opium Wars and things like this um, in history, that's clearly... Uh, the case. And I think it's, um, it, it's, it's America exerting its economic power as much as its military power. And, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. And it has particularly affected uh, the Iranians and the Venezuelans, uh, who, who are less able to respond in the way that China is, at least um, economically. Um, Black Lives Matter, I think, has opened a window, certainly in, in our discussion of the, the British colonial legacy. I'm having to deal with um, um, those have still got a, a very, um, a, a very uh, colourful image of uh, the British Empire in India. And I'm having a ding dong with right wingers about uh, Clive of India. Now, he, he was someone who actually, when he uh, not only got into India, looted the place and, and um, caused a famine and was castigated by his own peers in, in the United Kingdom in Parliament. Um, he actually grew the opium in India, in Bengal, to sell to the Chinese and began that, uh, that, the wars in that part of the world as much as the imperial extension. I'm afraid most of our, um, uh, uh, our history goes from Henry VIII and his six wives to the Second World War and the Nazis. And it doesn't really cover the Second World War very well at all. For, for example, we forget the, the numbers that the Soviet Union lost um, and also the Chinese perspective on the Second World War. But we just need to get to terms with this because I think it actually does colour the way we see ourselves and the way we see ourselves in the future. And it's important, I think, the anti-war movement maintains that because we have that issue as well in the Labour Party. Uh, I can say safely that actually at the beginning of the year, um, Stop the War found itself to be one, one of the most popular um, campaigning organisations within Labour members and I certainly intend to continue that because I think innately people do respond to the anti-war message not because of the geopolitics but they do understand that if you're a war economy you're going to spend more on military than you are on welfare and all the kind of things that people want and I think that's the important message the anti-war movement has in uh, the, the, the labour movement uh, and long may that continue and we, we do need to shed some light on our history because I don't think many British folk are actually up to date um, with what, uh, what havoc we have caused uh, around the world. Brilliant, thanks um, Murad. I'll go over to Emma and then Jenny. Um, yes, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, the, we're talking about uh, the sanctions against China, everything, but um, United States. 
and we are causing genuine poverty and hardship in many countries um, and, um, and, and genuine starvation. And if uh, people can't get the medication, for example, in Venezuela, they can't, they can't get the medication they need and, and people are going to die. And this is very much connected with um, um, how, how the uh, British imperialism has worked in the past. Um, and I've got generations of terrible relatives, including one who was involved in some, um, refining the opium to sell to the Chinese, and he's named named in the history books. I'm sorry to so, say, um, another one who is an anti-slave. I'm glad to say, but it's um, I do I agree entirely about the the history that we're taught. Uh, we're taught the um, you know the First World War, which is devastating and really upsets people and not that war shouldn't but it's why are we just learning that so as you know we're doing the colorful bit which is the Tudors and whatever bit of ruler history you know monarch after monarch after monarch um or, or uh, first world war which is which is gutting but you know it it nobody <laughs> it doesn't stop people going to war because they know how awful it is and that people have been gassed and written amazing poetry and so on so I do think we need to understand war where it relates to us and to our near and recent ancestry, actually. Um, and um, indeed, the uh, Black Lives Matter um, movement and um, the questioning of our people who were and weren't our heroes, Churchill and so on, we really need to understand those people that our grandparents knew, actually. Let's, let's, let's question that and see, um, um, you know, we're not, not that we had to line them all up and into goodies and baddies, but actually understand why they're coming from, why they make certain decisions, um, and uh, make um, history. Um, you know, let's let's investigate all those grey areas and why people made terrible decisions in the past. I think we have to make history relate to us, um, and that's partly race as uh, definitely. Um, and we all need to understand that, not not just to always say. Um, um because it's a bit more complex than that that you know the white british did terrible things because there was certainly slavery among other nations as well but but we need to understand that we need to understand it in its complexity um as i said if we don't understand that um um then we're not actually going to get history we won't get the lessons of history so um i don't want to talk about the labor party i'm a bit upset about it <laughs> But you know what? I stuck it out. I've been a loyal Labour member for many, many years, and I even campaigned for Tony Blair. God help me when I got chased down the road by numerous people. So um, I'm, I'm just shouting, it's better than the other lot, you know. So um, uh, yeah, difficult one. Um, that's me done. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. I'll go over to Jenny next. Um, yes. Uh, so. I if I can talk about the colonial heritage as well. I mean, I think that uh, on, first of all, on the question of the China threat and the yellow peril, I mean, you know, there've been fears that China, that the world was going to be swamped by Chinese going back to the 1880s. And uh, in uh, 1912, a chap co who called himself Sax Roma invented the figure of Fu Manchu, who was, uh, he, he, uh, said was going to take over the, uh, uh, impose a dictatorship over the whole world. Uh, these kinds of yellow peril fears were a way of drawing ordinary people onto the side of the colonial state and um, to drive a wedge between people here and the people who were struggling against colonialism. Um, I think that um, the um, we know uh, awareness of uh, the, the history of slavery, but once slavery ended, the British started on a, one of the most immoral wars, uh, which was to sell drugs to the Chinese. And we need to understand that is how we got Hong Kong. That is how we got Hong Kong in the first place. Um, and um, the... Um, uh, on the... Uh, on dealing with our colonial heritage, I think that there is an issue that people, when they find out about the immorality of uh, British colonialism, they don't know how to deal with it and they feel quite guilty about it and they resist it. And um, 
uh, I think it's very important that we actually show that throughout history, people in Britain actually oppose these things. You know, the Chartists had, had a far better foreign policy, you know, than, than, the, than the Labour parties had. You know, they opposed the Opium Wars, they opposed uh, the Indian Mutiny, um, and they spoke out against them. And I think that people will have to identify with that history of opposition within it within this country. I think as for the impact on China, I think that the Chinese, you know, we won the Opium Wars, we forgot about China, we forgot about the Opium Wars, we just forgot about it, so long as we could make money out of China, and we made loads and loads of money out of China. China, meanwhile, crumpled and had a hundred years of instability and, and wretchedness and poverty. They haven't forgotten about uh, the, 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 the problem, so it was devastating for them, but also, they had to look at their situation, say, what do we do about this? And their response was to start self-strengthening. And of course, that, uh, you know, China is still in the process of strengthening itself. So they, they, they look at this heritage as uh, uh, this history as a kind of double edged sword. And to, to today, uh, you know, Chinese still say we can learn from the West. We can learn from the West. We can learn from the West. But that they know what. Uh, you know, they know that, that the, the West can turn against them. Uh, so they see it as a, as a double edged sword, I think. And that's worth thinking about as well. Brilliant. Diane, do you want to come in on those questions? Yes, I'd say two things. First of all, as you all know, the reason that Trump is whipping up anti-foreigner, anti-Mexican and anti-Chinese sentiment is to appeal to that section of his electorate in post-industrial areas like the Midwest, like the Rust Belt, and get them to believe that somehow Chinese are responsible for the collapse, some of that industrial activity, other than the workings of, of the American capitalism and American bankers. And in an exact parallel process, Boris is willing to pander to anti-immigration sentiment. We just passed, but well, the Labour Party didn't vote for it. Thank goodness, but we passed an awful immigration bill yesterday. And that is all about pandering to anti-immigration sentiment so that people in the north of the northeast, parts of the north of England and the Midlands, who have suffered from deindustrialization are encouraged to turn their gaze on the other on immigrants and foreigners and blame them for their plight. And just finally, we should have a little bit about colonialism in our school curriculum. I was just thinking, I did a history level, I did a history A level, I read history at university. I never ever read a single sentence about British colonialism. And I do think it's time that British children with their colour, you know, learnt about British history in its totality. And that means learning about colonialism. Brilliant, thanks, Diane. I can assure people that my home school has become uh, it's significantly more anti-imperialist <laughs> curriculum for my children than they're used to at school, uh, shoehorning that in at every opportunity. Um, I, I wanted to make a brief comment, if I may, myself about is there a danger of the Labour Party becoming a more unfriendly place for the anti-war movement? There will be no friendlier a place than a Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. So, yes, it will be more unfriendly, but that doesn't mean there isn't a massive fight to be had to defend our internationalist principles and anti-war positions. Annual conferences where decisions are made. Our policies are currently anti-war. Their membership is anti-war. And I would urge Labour Party members to get involved in the National Policy Forum consultation that is going on at the moment that's just been extended to the 20th of July and put in your submissions about why we must keep our internationalist anti-war foreign policy um, because we're not going to give this up without a, without a fight. Um, I wanted to make a few comments before coming to our um, final round of questions for our speakers, which we'll, I'll ask them to answer and make any concluding remarks. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for, for joining in this evening. Um, we know we've got important battles ahead. Um, 
in the Labour Party and outside it um, across the world. And we know how important our campaigning can be for people, health, the planet and peace to be put before private profit and how essential events like this are for building understanding. And it's been brilliant to hear for from all our speakers from um, offering different but really valuable perspectives and please do get involved with Stop the War Coalition, CND, Labour CND, Stand Up to Racism and other campaigns on the vital issues we've discussed today. We must keep working together in, to insist there's no return to business as usual when it comes to our economy and politics and to argue that a better world it, and to not only argue that a better world is possible, but to win that better world. And a key part of that is our anti-war internationalism. I want to give a quick plug for the next Arise event, which is this Saturday, 7 p.m., um, resisting Trump in Latin America. He gets his hands everywhere, those little hands that Emma referred to. Um, building links and solidarity. And there's an amazing range of speakers, which I think you can see in the chat box or, or, or on the website. Um, a, a final round of questions for our speakers to address. So firstly, a comment from an NEU activist saying there is a big move starting through the NEU to decolonize the curriculum that's decolonize the curriculum that some local authorities are responding to positively. Any support that can be offered for that would be very welcome. There's a question from Facebook. Is it time to put the need to oppose Trident renewal back on the table? in a more dangerous world and with coronavirus costing the economy so much. Plus a question on Zoom from Sebastian, could there also be a war on Venezuela from Trump? So I'll take the speakers again in the same order they did before. And if you could um, answer those questions and um, make, a, make any other points you'd like to, uh, that would be brilliant. Um, over to you, Murad. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I, I, I would happily join the uh, in, uh, NEU uh, in, in their campaign to decolonise our history curriculum in our schools. As I said, I think there's a gaping hole there. I'm glad, Rachel, to hear you're trying to fill that gap. And um, what Diane said about uh, her history tell, says it all. Um, and there's also things we don't learn about British history. I mean, for example, um, it's, you, you get, uh, like I said, there's an emphasis on Henry VIII and his six wives, but we forget the English Civil War. And I think that's profoundly more important in, in, in British history than, than, than the attention it, it gets at the moment. So that, that's to be welcomed. And I think that's uh, an ongoing uh, campaign. And I hope it can be done in a way which actually can get to young people before they come into uh, their working lives. Uh, as for the tri Trident renewal, I think that's something we've got to up the stakes again and raise quite clearly. I actually thought it was quite interesting. There was recently Trump uh, made a comment. He didn't realise we had that um, we had a nuclear deterrent at all. I.e., he he was given away that the, the secret that actually it's not us who has control of that deterrent; it's the Americans. And I think we've got to use opportunities like that to. Uh, expose some of the myths around uh, an independent deterrent. It's not actually, it was, it's always been under American crown and will be in the foreseeable future. And that's a very good argument not to have it, I would suggest to a lot of people who may be uh, minded to, to go along with it. Uh, and as, as for wars on Venezuela and what have you, I, I, I get the feeling that if anything, um, the um, Trump is over stretching himself. If he's going to have walls all over the place on the back of economic sanctions. I mean, let's face it, at the beginning of the year, there was a re really good likelihood of a war in, with Iran. Um, then uh, he switched his, his attention to Venezuela and now to China. Um, I, th th there's always one thing you learn militarily if you play games like Risk is um, you, you can overstretch yourself very easily, very quickly and be exposed. And I think that may explain why the military in the US now are coming out against him. But uh, it's not just him, it's also the system. And I think we've got to support people like the Bernie Saunders of the world in the, the other side of the pond on their arguments, because you know he's clearly being anti-war. He wants to end all these endless wars in the Middle East um, and actually reprioritize um, um, the, 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 the huge budgets that they spend on the military uh, on their bases around the world onto more domestic concerns, because that's where most of the Rust Belt and people who um, Trump's aiming for um, 
really do need assistance and help on that front rather than being given all the garbage they, that they get from him. My final word is that we've got to make sure we join all the campaigns we've got already, stop the war campaign, uh, CND, uh, and, and uh, um, regularly come to events like Arise to show that we can actually lead on the ideas and principles that should guide uh, the Labour Party and the left on policies on this front and be confident of that because I think um, if, uh, if anything uh, the Black Lives Matter shows that if you're persistent the tide will come your way and when it does you will have scope to not only deal with you, your immediate agenda but many other people's agendas on, 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 on race and equality issues. Brilliant, thank you Murad and thank you for all the work you do in this area. Um, I've just been corrected to say the Saturday's Arise meeting on Latin America is at 2pm, not 7pm, so if you tune in at 7pm you'll miss it, so tune in at 2pm please, and I'm sure you've got other things to do on a Saturday evening. Um, I'm going to come to Emma next, please. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yes, I also support the NEU, the amazing union, and they're 100% right on this. So as I say, we need to we need to look behind these these guards on on plinths. And uh, I'm I'm not sure. This is a very personal thing for me. I'm not sure that the answer to that is to pull them down and put other people on plinths. I just I, there's a this is entirely personal. I think it's a bit of a problem about deifying people. We need to understand people who have done amazing things. That they are human and they're, they're like us and so we could be more like them so you know the idea that how by um defacing um a statue of somebody that you've got you've kind of broken some some magic about them um is also wrong but replacing one group of, of gods on plinths with another i don't know that's a that's a personal thing for me but absolutely we really need to understand our colonial past um and um, yeah, as I said earlier, I'm coming to terms with some of the things in my own family and I'm not going to beat myself up about my whole life, but it's really important to understand um, uh, the, the human aspects of all of that. Um, yeah, Trident Renewal is absolutely uh, uh, unforgivable at a time when we have people feeding people out of their pockets. We have teachers, and this has been going on for a while, but there are teachers who are really um, um, impoverishing themselves to feed the as school children because however many mutual aid groups and they are incredible out there um there isn't enough there still isn't enough we've got terrible problems in north Kent, and we've got an awful lot of help interestingly i think the people who have been furloughed or aren't working or are working from home who've been working in these mutual aid groups their eyes have been opened rather to to the the, the, the struggle of their neighbors um and i think that's a positive thing and i think that's something we can build on actually um, because they have seen things that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. So I think we need to do that. But but spending, what is it, 30 billion uh, renewing something that we can never use because it would be genocide. Um, I think it's unforgivable when people are hungry. Um, yeah, I'm, I am quite worried about Venezuela, but I accept what um, Rarit is saying, that um, he's overreaching himself. But Venezuela needs an awful lot of help and support from us and from everybody. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, for the record, I've been working very hard on something over lockdown, and that's going to come out in a month or two. So I'm going to let you all know about it. I've been working on a thing, um, which some people won't like, but you all will. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I'll let you know when it's happening. Um, yeah, but more generally, I think we really have to hang on to our integrity at a time like this and I'll remember our social values because more and more people are understanding what that means. And I, through all the professions that I work with, architecture, construction, so on in my other life as an um, architecture journalist, um, they're all recognizing it. They're really changing the way they work. So that's really interesting. And they're challenging the government about how they work. Um, so we have to hang on to all of that or really remember who we are. Um, and you know, people keep saying we're on a pause, I've been busier than ever, but we use the pause, if we like, in our lives or physically running around to rethink and, and consolidate our base. Um, uh, join everything and contribute, that's what I say. Thank you so much, Emma. And you've left us all very intrigued with your little teaser. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to hearing what that might be and how many people you can annoy with it. Um, Jenny, over to you for answers to those questions and some concluding remarks, please. 
Uh, yes, of course, campaigning against Trident renewal, and the figure is actually 200 billion when you include the running costs. Um, I, I'm also watching what is going to happen in the Tories uh, integrated defence and security review, because I want to see whether they're going to align more with Trump's uh, national security strategy in identifying Russia and China um, as, as uh, threats to be dealt with, uh, which of course will entail more military spending. Um, and also an adjustment of nuclear posture because the United States have decided that they might use nuclear weapons in the case of a cyber attack, which is really scary. Uh, the United States is also developing these mini nukes and they've deployed these mini nukes now on submarines. Um, they um, have a killing power. They're supposed to have a killing uh, a power of about an, a third of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. So only 80,000 people uh, dead with that. Um, just, uh, I'd, I'd like to sort of make a couple of remarks uh, to conclude. Just before I came on here, I watched the news and uh, I think two things really juxtaposed. First of all, was that um, Johnson was questioned about how many jobs are being lost. And then the next bit of the news was that we're going to invite so, so many people over uh, from Hong Kong. I mean, really, people will know what side their bread is buttered on. They're not going to get jobs here. They're going to stay in Hong Kong because that's where the jobs are. That is where the development takes place. They can easily get um, a, a metro link over to China and, and work in Shenzhen. Um, the other thing was that, of course, the Americans uh, talk about America first. They're buying up all of the drug now that it is used to treat um, the virus. I mean, you know, China, on the other hand, has said that it's committed to developing a vaccine, which is going to be a global public good. So, you know, we have to think about the positives. I don't think people really know enough about China. They don't pay uh, China um, enough attention and the Tory party have a China research group. I think the Labour Party should set up a China research group. Um, obviously there are human rights issues but we need to really think through this because you know if we're going to put sanctions on it doesn't make any difference. You know how can we be effective? Um, in actual fact Chinese students come over in their tens of thousands to study at universities here. They don't just study engineering or STEM subjects, they study journalism, they study law, and they go back to China uh, with, their, with their skills and knowledge. And that makes a difference. So, you know, alienating the China, always being negative uh, about China is not the way to go about things. And, and you know, berating them on human rights issues um, is just seen as a way of asserting Western superiority. So there's a lot that we need to think about. Brilliant. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you for bringing your expertise and take on board what Emma said about statues. But um, I am part of the Diane Abbott statue should be <laughs> uh, built right away, although I prefer the real thing. Um, and over to Diane as our last speaker. OK, can you hear me? No. Oh, yes. Yeah? Yes. Well, first of all, on the curriculum, as I said before, we need to learn about British history in its entirety, and that involves colonialism. We also actually, talking about the curriculum as a whole, I'd like to see more black writers and more black poets on the curriculum. So people have a sense of the contribution of people of colour and people from all parts of the world to, to, to the society. Is the Labour Party now a less comfortable place for actual activists? You know, I think the anti-war message has much greater resonance than the right of the Labour Party want to accept. I remember after the Manchester terror attacks and Jeremy gave a major speech, which we tried to dissuade him from making, saying that part of the problem with terrorism, we had created the conditions with some of our illegal wars. And the interesting thing was when we polled that speech, it went down very well with some Tories. Because some of this is just common sense, not ideology. Ideology is common sense. Um, uh, should we put stopping Trident Renewal back on the agenda? I'm afraid for me, stopping Trident Renewal never came off the agenda. Um, I think it's something we need to continue to campaign on. I suppose finally what I will say is this. These are very difficult times. 
Um, but there are reasons to be hopeful. I think one of the interesting things about the Lives Matter movement is the numbers of young people, both black and white, who are involved, which I've never quite seen before. And so I suppose my final line is, because the old lines are the best, don't more organise. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, Diane, and thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to everyone who's joined, and we look forward to continuing this discussion at the next meeting on Saturday at 2pm. Thanks again for, to everyone who's taken part.